So it is 9.01, and if you want to uh, introduce David, we can go from there. Thanks. OK. Um, good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to the seminar. It's my privilege this morning to uh, introduce uh, David Haynes, um, our speaker. David is a assistant professor in uh, the medical school in um, the Institute for Informatics, uh, technically in the Department of Medicine, but, um, but that's really his uh, home base. Just gonna give you a little bit of background about um, David. Uh, he, I guess way back in the day, wanted to be a doctor, but went to college at Co College in uh, Iowa, where he um, took a lot of biology courses, including uh, environmental biology. Um, which led to uh, his interest in uh, geography and um, uh, geospatial um, uh, disciplines. He did a master's in uh, geography at St. Mary's in um, Winona, and then a PhD at the University of Iowa, where he worked on the Iowa cancer maps, um, looking at cancer at the sub-county uh, level uh, using small area estimation techniques. He then worked at the Minnesota Population Center and then did a postdoc with the PhDR program in health disparities research at um, the University of Minnesota. He's done collaborations with the Minnesota Department of Health on the SAGE program, looking at breast cancer screening in Minnesota. Um, and then um, happily for me, uh, joined our uh, study team on a diversity supplement. Finally, he joined our faculty um, as an assistant professor with one of the med school C CTSI uh, Early Research Career Awards. And he's got a longstanding interest in health disparities, geography, and public health. And so is a great example of um, a multidisciplinary researcher. Since we're all starved for um, fun facts about people, I won't say anything really embarrassing. <laughs> David, but you'll see from his background, um, he grew up in rural Alaska. Um, so that's one fun fact. And another is that I found this online. He is a geo hipster. <laughs> he was interviewed um, by a, uh, the geo hipster group. And, um, and David is a, uh, I don't know if it's present, but certainly a past national rugby player. And he aspires one day to teach a course on the geography of sports. So there's our fun fact for the day and um, welcome. David, um, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks, Anne. <laughs> uh, thank you for the nice introduction and um, thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, as Anne said, I'm an assistant professor with the Institute for Health Informatics, and today I'm going to talk to you about the research that I've been conducting for the last three years on breast cancer screening disparities in Minnesota. And this talk has a, a really long title. It's uh, Developing the Community Knowledge to Action Toolkit to Reduce Breast Cancer Screening Disparities. Let's connect. And the idea or the approach that I'm going to talk to you about today are the data and the analytical methods that I use to um, understand breast cancer screening disparities in Minnesota and try to involve community to change that. So there's a couple of takeaways that I want uh, to help get you to understand today and that will be really just what is health geography and how can that provide a richer understanding for um, cancer disparities and I'm going to really talk about the breast cancer screening disparities in Minnesota and how can community engaged research um, affect change and what the work that we're doing today with breast cancer. So to do that, I'm just gonna give you a brief background on GIS and health geography since that may be unfamiliar to some of you. And then I'm going to dive into some of the work that I've been doing on estimating breast cancer screening disparities at the, in Minnesota and what we're doing to get them at the neighborhood level. Then we're gonna 
talk a bit about the work that we're doing right now with connecting with community and how we're taking the knowledge that we gathered um, from estimating those cancer rates to direct resources to different community programs and what are the future directions of our research. So what is GIS? Uh, GIS is uh, geographic information systems, which basically is, is a software program on a computer, which allows us to manipulate, edit, and visualize spatial data. Uh, you might think of this as something very common like Waze or Google Maps. And basically this is the um, ability to try and think about that. And GIS is the underlying technology that we use in this case. Um, and so what we really do as geographers, we really think about the real world and and try to break that into very small components, very little pieces of data. And so what you can see in the image there on the right, you have the real world. And what we try to do is conceptualize what that actually looks like as data. And so we have various different aspects of information that we try to draw out of this. Uh, one of the major uh, software developing companies, Esri, has a really interesting logo called, or a motto, the science of where. And the idea behind that is if you're interested in thinking that context or place has something to do with a particular health outcome, then you really should wanna to talk to a geographer because that's really what we try to do and understand. We really try to think about how does the environment or the context really affect some sort of health outcome. And so um, what I'm gonna to talk to you today is about how we're using that to understand breast cancer screening disparities. There's a couple of different aspects that we really have to think about when we're talking about breast cancer screening disparities. And that is really thinking about the two models of data that we have. So we're gonna take the real world and the environment very broadly. And we're gonna think about how can we represent this? So there's two ways that we can represent it. Um, and the first one is this vector model. And so we think that we can represent anything in the, that's out there that we in the world in terms of three things, points, lines, or polygons. And so you can see this hydrological representation of those things. So we have wells, we have rivers, and we have lakes. But what's really important to think about with these are these are discrete conceptualizations of space. They have very fixed um, spaces where they exist, and that's what you're going to use to understand them. Often in health data, we think about this as cases of, of people that have a particular health uh, outcome or disease, and then being geocoded or having X, Y locations to where they actually live. Um, and so the whole idea behind this is that this is a discrete conceptualization of space. But there's also a second model that we use, and that's the raster model or grid or pixel, all similar terms. And basically what this is, is instead of a discrete conceptualization of space, more of a continuous dis uh, description of space. And so what you can see with this is that we have, this really derives from the data that we usually get this from. And so you can think we, we get this from satellite data. So you may be familiar with things like greenness or, or soil or night lights or things like that, um, where we're actually trying to think about information across broad spaces. But it can also be from other sorts of data sets. And so what we, and what I really try to focus on is how we can use the raster model to de depict a sort of a spatial process. And what I'm really gonna to talk to you today and why these two things are important, these two models, is how I start with some data that's in a vector model and I transform it over to the raster model. You'll be able to see from the picture from Obama and what's really important to think about with the raster model is that there's all of those pixels have particular values. And so what's really different between the raster and the vector models with the raster, you can get these radiations or variations of uh, disease. And so that's really important for really understanding what happens there. And, and health geography, you know, really was started off with this idea of John Snow and the Broad Street Pump, which you guys are all familiar with. And so, you know, here is an image of that map. And, you know, the idea here is that he was walking around, he was tallying people that were sick, and he was able to deduce by essentially the relationship between where the people were and the pump, the number of people that were sick in the pump, um, that the, the Broad Street pump is, is actually was the, was the source of the outbreak. And I'm going to kind of use that similar sort of idea, but kind of tweak it a little bit, because often the researchers that I work with um, 
have an idea of the number of cases of a particular disease or outcome. But often the people that are at risk are not, is not everyone. And so often what I'll try to do is think about the denominator. What is the population at risk and how do you quantify that? And that's really kind of be the work that I'm gonna show you today is how do you think about that? So I'm gonna start off by going through some of the work that I've been doing on estimating breast cancer screening disparities. So I've been working with the Minnesota Department of Health um, SAGE program, which is a national breast and cervical colorectal cancer early detection program. Uh, these programs are available in every state. And what they primarily do are recruit, uh, provide events or, or recruit women to do breast cancer screening. This is a really great resource that's available for many women in the, process, in the state of Minnesota. And they really help provide access to care, um, particularly for breast cancer. So they provide funding for women that are uninsured or underinsured to be screened. Now, what they had noticed over the last few years there was that the number of women that they were seeing screened every year was going down. And this could be done, could, could be a result of more women getting access to uh, insurance and being screened, but they weren't really quite sure. Additionally, if they screened 10,000 women, they weren't sure were they reaching all of the women in Minnesota that could be screened. Uh, nationally, what we've seen in some of the um, papers on this is that we've seen that while there have been increased numbers, total numbers of people that have been screened across for these programs, the actual percentage of all the women that are eligible to be screened is actually going down. And so, what I was going to help them do was really think about how can you actually think about how many women are actually eligible to be screened and how can we quantify that? And so we kind of came up with a number of hypotheses around this. Uh, so I was familiar with the small area mapping techniques and I wanted to know, could we use this to estimate this? We had done this previously for um, cancer incidence rates, but could we use this for screening? Could we actually estimate how many people were eligible for screening um, a little bit of a different conceptual model. And then the idea behind this, again, would be what would be the level of detail that would be available? And I, I'm gonna go through a number of examples, but right now we didn't know if we were to do this technique, would we be able to know this for the county? Would we be able to know this for the zip code? Or would we be able to know this for something more resolute like uh, a city block? And what those different levels of information would obviously impact our ability to communicate um, valuable information back to the stakeholders. And then uh, lastly would be, can this knowledge be used to direct in community engagement? So from the state, would they be able to use this to direct their resources? Would they be able to talk to community organizations to engage them? How would this be able to use to address this uh, particular problem? So the uh, SAGE program has very specific criteria. And so each of these programs um, have different criteria across from each state for how they decide to distribute the resources. And so I'm only gonna talk very specifically about what happens in Minnesota. This is not necessarily applicable to other states. So for Minnesota, they will screen any woman um, that is 40 years old that it meets an income threshold, which is less than 250% above the poverty. Any woman can be screened if they meet that criteria. They also differ from the recommendations in that they allow a woman to be screened every year if she qualifies. So if you qualify every year, you can be screened every year. They also have a working relationship with the Indian Health Services. And so if you are a American Indian woman or you belong to one of these two groups, you can qualify just based on your age. And so those are the two criteria that they're going to use for screening and they've been using historically for screening their women. And so we need to take that to an account when we're looking at doing some sort of analysis. So this program has been going on for over 20 years and we're gonna actually just look at some of the data that they had been doing from 2010 to 2014. So, now we start to get into some maps and some sort of analyses. Uh, th this is what the client distribution of SAGE looks like from 2010 to 2014. So they're screening across the entire state. The, they regularly screen women um, every year in every single county. And 
what's important to think about this is if you have a method that needs a lot of data information or a lot of information, it's only going to work in the highly populated areas. And so what we really need to think about are, are there analysis techniques that will work across this entire study area? We have going to have places in the rural places where there's going to be very little population, and we're going to have other areas where we have lots and lots of population and lots of good, so we can make really high estimates. So we really need to think about what are the techniques that could be used to work across both of these study areas, which are high and low population density. Uh, and so the technique that we ended up using was the spatially adaptive filters. And I'm going to try to explain this a little bit, but this is some work that I, we've been developing over the years. And um, I will be talking about this throughout late, later in the year if you're really interested in this particular technique. Uh, so the spatially adaptive filters um, are a really interesting technique for working in high and low density population uh, data sets. So it starts with these really dark grid points, which are these 16 black grids. And so what happens is we go out from each of these small black grids points to these lighter gray cases. And we're gonna draw essentially these big circles that get bigger and bigger to increase a certain population. So we tell each of these filters or these circles that they have to get big enough to reach 500 people. When they reach 500 people, we think that we essentially eliminate the small number problem. We're gonna be able to have a much more stable estimate for a particular uh, calculation, and then we can calculate it. So you're gonna see that in the high density areas on the left, the filters end up being smaller, particularly in the bottom left corner, the this, this circle is much smaller. But as we go to the top right and we get into the more rural areas, the filter gets bigger. But we're always keeping the same denominator. We're always keeping 500 people contained within that circle. And that's gonna allow for a stable estimate. And we had done this previously before on a variety of different data sets, but uh, on this particular problem, we're going to push the limits quite a bit. So for our particular grid and for the study area of Minnesota, we're gonna do the entire state. We're gonna put about 8,000 grid points down across the entire state. They're gonna be about 5,000 meters apart. And then what we're gonna do, because the SAGE program uh, screens women every year and they allow women to be screened every year, we're gonna take all the instances of screening that they have occurred within that five year time period. And we're gonna geocode them. And then we ended up finding um, a really interesting data set. Um, it's, it's a thin synthetic population data set, which is developed by the Research Triangular Institute. Um, what they have developed is a synthetic population data set for the entire US that actually uses um, a different spatial analysis technique called asymmetric mapping to take data and using satellite information and road networks actually geocode synthetic people synthetic households to um, the world. And so you have actual households with XY coordinates for the whole US. And you can use that data um, to actually come up and, and link it to a population data set. So you can actually get totally synthetic populations for the entire US that are aligned with the American Community Survey data. And so this is just representative information of households across the state. So we're gonna use this for Minnesota. And what we're gonna do is actually come up with synthetic households for every woman in Minnesota. And because we are doing this over five years, we're gonna actually multiply that by five to come up with the same criteria. And then what's gonna actually happen for this within the calculation is we're gonna do this really complex distance matrix. We're actually gonna to have to go out from every single grid point, every single 8,000 point to every single household within Minnesota. And we're gonna do that to kind of calculate these filters. And we're gonna to try to find for each filter 500 women. And then we're gonna see what is the relationship between the number of women that we think are eligible to be screened versus those that have cases. And I should mention that the synthetic population data set, in addition just to having the location, it actually gives information about the household income, the age of the person and the sex. So we're gonna be able to use that in our criteria. So this is the resulting map of this. This is how we're estimating breast cancer screening rates for Minnesota. 
and you're going to see that we have some really specific patterns of disease. Overall, your impression would be that the screening rate is quite low for Minnesota. It seems like for all the women that we think are eligible to be screened, that only about 13%, if you take an average of this, um, we're screening about 13% of the rape. Uh, but you'll also see that there are also some really high areas. If you look over by the American Indian communities, that we actually have some Indian Health Service, um, Indian Health Services at, they're screening at really high rates. They're actually reaching about 100 and 104 percent. And this is really good because we, for SAGE, to know that, okay, in some areas they're doing really, really well for reaching their target population. So basically what we're finding in most of the American Indian communities where they have American Indian Health Services, any woman that's eligible is being screened there. So that's really good for understanding who they're reaching. And then you might say, well, why are you getting a, over 100%? That seems like a, that's an error. And, and you're right. Uh, the 104% is because we're using the synthetic population data set to come up with this. And census historically undercounts groups like minority po populations, particularly American Indians. And so we're not necessarily capturing all of the people that are there um, in our denominator. And so we're getting a little bit of an error here, but it's very small. So this was the first map that we came up with to look at screening rates in Minnesota. And you can see that the screening rate here, we have these different patches and the gradients are really helpful for seeing the variation. So you're seeing where we're having higher and lower rates of disease, but overall the pattern's pretty low. So how does this compare with traditional mapping methods? So here I'm gonna put the spatially adaptive filter on the map on the left, and then I'm gonna have a core cleft map on the right. And the core breath map is one map that you're probably more familiar with. Um, and so let me just explain how we come up with this particular map on the right. So we have all of the coordinates of the synthetic people and the women that were screened through the SAGE program. And so what I'm gonna do for the map on the right is I'm gonna find every county that they reside in. I'm gonna see which one they do and I'm gonna count them up. And so, that uses the exact same data that we essentially use for the adaptive filter, but it's using a different technique to come up with the map and the representation of the data. And so if I do this, we get this choropleth plus map at the county level. And so this particular map here is showing us what is actually happening within the actual data. So by transforming it over to the county map, you think, well, you know, your overall impression is like, well, we're screening at a much better rate. Overall, the map looks a lot better but you're actually getting a false impression because if you look over by Duluth in Virginia County, you're assuming that that rate is constant for that entire study area. And that gives a false impression of what's really happening there. So the screening rate is actually a lot worse, but it seems better because we're taking that for the entire um, unit. We can't see the variation within it. And so this is typically what you typically see in a map, the choropleth. And this is not exactly the same sort of detail that you get with the adaptive filter. Now, if I take that same technique, the Coropleth map technique, and I move it into the um, zip code, we get a map that's much more representative of what you see with the adaptive filter. This is, again, using the same exact technique, just switching the units that are, we're using to kind of define the area. Same data. And so the map really becomes much more similar to what you see over on the left. They look more similar, but you're gonna see we actually get more error. Um, so if you look at the zip collection at the top, you're gonna to see that we actually get up to 120%. Um, northeast of Duluth, you're gonna see over by Ely that there is a, a one zip code that is really irregularly shaped. It is actually kind of split across. And so what actually happens in this case is we get really strange population counts and they get up to screening rates of 120%. And this is really one of the problems with small area techniques. So if you wanna know something for a place where there's um, small area, meaning a rural population, low density population, or you wanna find places where there's a very small geography, the getting reliable estimates for those things are really tough because one or two people can really affect the total population. Now we're really controlling for that with the um, adaptive map, the raster on the, on the left. We're actually really able to control that. We're not getting strange fluctuations in the variation. 
Additionally, you can see more information about the map. So if I go ahead and zoom into this map for the American Indian communities, we can actually see high levels of detail of what's actually happening here. And so you're gonna see that in the American Indian communities in particular, where are we seeing these really high rates of utilization? Um, and so you can see that where these people are living, this is where we're actually able to find where people are at. And this is really good and useful information. Um, in particular, you can see that Red Lake, um, it is actually mostly, the reservation is mostly the lake. And so the people really live around the perimeter of that. And so that's where we're really screening and finding the information. How does this also look in the cities? So if you look at Minneapolis and St. Paul, um, and these are the neighborhoods of Minneapolis and St. Paul, you can see that the screening rate is actually not as bad. We're actually seeing these nice little splotches. And you'll be able to see that we have these pixels, right? These little cells. And that's actually the finest resolution that we were able to create for all of this data. So these are actually 500 by 500 pixels. So they're about the size of a, a city block um, where we're actually able to kind of see what's happening here at that local level. And you, so you can see like in the neighborhood of Powderhorn, which is just south of, the, of Minneapolis, we actually got up to a screening rate of about 80%. So this is really helpful because now we're able to think about information that we know about these particular neighborhoods. So we can think about different neighborhoods having different demographics and where those, we can really think, well, are we really reaching all those people in those communities? And so uh, in particular, Sage had thought they were doing a really good job reaching most of the women in North Minneapolis, near North. Uh, but you can see that there were still a number of women that were out there that they could screen. So when they had a screening event and they screened, you know, 50 women in that neighborhood, there might have been an, another 50 that they should have reached. And so this really allows them to think about the directing of their resources and really thinking about how they can actually quantify how many women are actually able to be screened in each of these areas. So the interesting thing about this is we've really been able to do a number of things. We've been able to calculate and really quantify how many women should be screened, how many women we think are eligible to be screened, and compare that to denominator to get a percentage. And we're not going to be bound now by the geographic unit. So if you're looking to do something with the zip code, if you're going to send out mailings, you're going to do advertisement, and you want to do this by zip code, we can quantify that by zip code. We can also quantify it by county or voting district. And no matter what unit you decide to do the quantification by, the underlying data remains solid throughout the whole thing. And so you're not having a problem with this. We've also created some stable aids of uh, estimates of breast cancer screening. In particular, we've been able to get this essentially about the city block level. And this is one of the really new and interesting things about this. Um, using this RTI data set, we've been able to really push the understanding of what that data should look like. Um, and that's really been helpful for understanding at the neighborhood level how to engage with communities. Uh, and then there was just a little bit of a limitation with this. When we did this, we assumed that uh, everyone was uninsured. We assumed that the estimate for uninsurance was essentially even across the population. And we know that that's not accurate. And so that's one of the things that we're, um, we're working on right now publishing. So let's just kind of take that apart. For the SAGE program focuses on screening uninsured and underinsured women. What we really need is a estimate for a particular area. So for instance, let's say, say something like Minneapolis for black women who are 55 years old that make $55,000 a year. What's the likelihood that that woman either doesn't have insurance or is underinsured? Those estimates don't exist. Um, they, they just don't exist. There's no sort of cross tabulation of that. So what we've done and what our approach has been to, is to use what's available. So the American Community Survey does provide really interesting estimates by zip code um, and by census tract for different categories. So we can actually get information by age and sex. We can get estimates by race and we can get estimates by income. 
but we can't get an estimate for those multiple tabulations. So what we've actually done is we've actually kind of combined those together. We take, we, because we have that in our data set, because the RTI data set provides for every woman, her age, her race, and her income, we can now kind of estimate that using the data that's available within the American Community Survey. And so we call this our composite model. And our composite model uh, looks like this. Uh, and so essentially what you have here are really similar in some ways maps. The spatial patterns are very similar from the original to the newer composite. They've just really increased the total um, amount of the utilization rate, right? The number of women that are actually using the services because we've actually reducing the denominator. We're actually getting a much more fine understanding of who is eligible. So what you're seeing here is that we still have high utilization rates in the same communities that we had before. So if you look over in the American Indian communities, um, the utilization rate is still quite high, but we're getting other areas that are showing up as being high. So um, west of Brainerd, kind of in the central part of the state, you can see that another area starts to show up as a hot, as a hot spot, a good area for utilization. Um, we're also showing over uh, in Mankato and Rochester and the southern portions of the state that there are other communities where we're having good utilization rates. And now we can start to want, think about what's happening within those communities. So because we think that we have a much better understanding of the true utilization rate, which will be the women that are eligible to be screened, how many of them are being screened, we can now start focusing on things like those particular organizations that are there how are they engaging and working with their communities? And so those are some of the next steps um, that we're kind of working with. Um, and so what's really good with this as well is that if you look over in the legend for the composite map, you're gonna see that we still have the same utilization rate. We're still at 104%. So we still have a little bit of error, but it's just a tiny amount. So we've really controlled for a lot of the error and overall, like we have a really good understanding of where we're really using and this resource. Um, and so SAGE can be really productive and really going out and helping their community. So how do you take this information that we've gathered and translate this over to community engagement? How do you take this, this information about low screening rates and engage with women uh, particularly African American women and immigrant African women in the grant that we got on how to use that information to really drive community engagement. And so that's what I'll talk about for the next uh, 20 minutes, I guess, will be how do you do that? So these are some pictures of our champions and some of the work that they're doing. So we know that breast cancer screening disparities are exist for Black women. Um, nationally, we've seen that um, or historically, we've seen that breast or Black women have had lower um, incidence rates, but higher mortality rates. And recently, we've seen that those rate incidence rates are becoming much more um, similar. So for screening for Black women is similar to that what we're seeing for non-Hispanic white women. But overall, Black women are still dying at a higher rate. And so that's why the SAGE program in particular is a really important resource for them to know about because this is essentially free screening that they can get access to. They need to be screening at similar rates and, at, and potentially higher rates than their um, non-Hispanic white women. And, and this treatment and, and getting access to treatment and getting access to screening is critical for this. And so that was reason why we really thought that we could direct that based upon what we saw in the maps about the how we could kind of direct our resources towards. Also, we've also found within this is that immigrant African women also have um, lower screening rates. And so some work um, by some researchers in Minnesota found that they also had barriers around language and culture. And how did you think about introducing screening into their community to increase their screening rates? Now, within the data, they often these two communities often get lumped together, essentially as Black or African. Um, but they're very different cultures and different mindsets. And so we had to really think about how would we 
engage both of these communities to help them uh, increase their access to care. So we developed the Breast Cancer Champions Project, and this is a collaborative effort between uh, the Masonic Cancer Center, the Program for Health Disparities, SAGE, and the Breast Cancer Education Association. And so the idea is to take the information and the data that we've collected to do some community-engaged work to really address breast cancer screening disparities. So to do this, we're going to take um, an interesting approach to engaging with communities. We have um, some community partners. We have the Department of Health. We also have the Breast Cancer Education Association, and it's related to the Sister Standing Up to Breast Cancer, which has um, historically done a lot of work in the Black community to increase um, access to breast cancer treatments and things like that. So what our main idea is going to be is we're going to develop a, a curriculum and we're going to train some women who come from immigrant African and African American communities to become champions, we're going to use that term a lot, um, to go out into the community and recruit women to do screening. We're, we're in, train, in training this curriculum or developing this curriculum and training the ch uh, champions, they're also going to go out and they're going to recruit more women. And the idea is that by recruiting more and more waves of women, we get a better education into the community for breast cancer education. We get a better understanding of what are the resources available in the community. And this we hope will be a really good way of engaging women by working with the organization um, Sisters Standing Up to Breast Cancer to get organizations like Park Nicolet and the Stair Step Down Foundation and, and Cora McCorvey Center to all kind of use our resources together to really engage with this community. So our first main aim was to essentially develop this curriculum. And that's what I'm gonna focus on now is kind of explain to you how we did this. Uh, the, the Minnesota Department of Health, a number of years ago, had done a really good job of developing a cancer education curriculum that they would go out to communities and talk about. Um, but this training that they had developed in this curriculum ended up being about eight hours long, which was quite long. And so we really wanted to try and reduce it to about two hours, focusing, focusing specifically on breast cancer. And in doing that, we kind of needed to look at three main things. We wanted to improve the approach to education. So how do we make sure that this information is very targeted to the particular audience so that we have digestible bits of information that they can easily understand? How do we make sure this is culturally appropriate? This is often one of the things that's really um, neglected. So how do we think that all of the terms and the imagery that we use is culturally appropriate and representative of the people that we're trying to reach? And then this training was old and so we needed to really update scientific advancements. So what are the new things that are out there? Um, our champions in the community is actually really hungry for understanding what are those sorts of things that are out there. So how do we bring that information and knowledge into the training so that they feel that they are um, empowered to go out there and do this. And our champions are really going to be charged with doing a lot of work here. They're going to be recruiting women, not only for screening, but also to become future champions. They're going to be educating their peers and their community. And we just need to really focus on deploying them and getting them and helping them understanding which communities that they need to go out there and get and be screened. So we're really focusing on those communities that don't have access to healthcare and those that may be on the point where they are like, well, I could do it, but it's gonna be expensive. And so trying to help them understand that SAGE will provide these resources. So those are the places that we're really going to target. So here's an education slide um, that we developed. And so you are probably have seen something like this in a talk on the left, and this is kind of how we transformed it. And the whole idea here is besides just the bright pink colors um, for our, our program is to really tell them what do we really want you to focus in on. So we really try to make sure that all the slides that we produce when we're doing the training really just target and tell them for each slide, what are the main takeaway points that you need. So in this case, we really wanna say, when you're looking at breast cancer in Minnesota, um, based on the data from 2012 to 2016, white Hispanic women are being diagnosed at higher rates than black women. That's just really the takeaway point here. And so we really provide very targeted bits of information that's easy for them to be able to understand and take back to their community. 
including culture um, is actually really interesting. So here we've tried to think about a concept like social determinants of health or determinants of health in this case, which are very common in you know, the academic literature, but not as common in community. And so how do you try to break that down into things that they can understand and represent that with imagery as well? So I think we've really done a good job here in trying to help them say, and, and, and because we're working with two very distinct communities, um, make sure that both are equally represented with, throughout this. And so we're using some imagery here and also providing very simple takeaway points that they can easily understand about what they need to be telling women when they're engaging with them, what are the things that they should be thinking of. Cultural barriers can actually be, um, are really, an issue and it's really great to work with the champions and, and talk about these things because they're actually really uh, important to try to get through. Um, but there's lots of different cultural values that are really difficult to try to break through and help understand. Um, one that one of our champions brought up was preventive care. And basically just telling us, you know, that those terms and that terminology, that thinking is not in my culture. Um, you know, a lot of these cultures really think about, uh, you know, preventative care is a Western concept and it doesn't translate. So how do you try to think about changing a mindset in a talk where, you know, disease doesn't just have to happen to you. There are ways that if you get this disease, you can extend your life or increase your ability to go do things. And so trying to really focus on and changing our language when we're talking about this with a champ, this has been really important to make sure that we're really addressing these cultural barriers that are gonna come up when these champions are really doing this because they're doing a lot of the work of working with everyone to break down a lot of these barriers. And so we need to make sure that we're adequately equipping them with the right amount of knowledge. And um, another issue that really came up was thinking about um, the reluctance to speak about cancer. Often, I think that um, many of the women kind of recounted how there's this Kind of question when you're going to the healthcare provider of like what's your history or your family's history with cancer and sometimes uh, particularly in the african-american community that wasn't something that's always talked about so some people may have died of cancer but that wasn't really talked about it was kind of a hush hush subject so how do you think about making sure that people who may not know that someone died in their family of cancer because it wasn't really talked about they just don't are not informed about their own family history and so how these, these women really talk, um, because many of them are cancer survivors themselves, with community members about how to go about and find that out. Like you need to go ask about, you know, if someone died early, what they, did they die of? And really try to find out that information. But we don't do this all on our own. Um, you know, we also re reach out to researchers, um, like many of you, about how to do this with your expertise. Um, our champions, many of them um, are, have been diagnosed with cancer and they want to be able to take out valuable information. So we have a, a whole module that kind of breaks down cancer and really explains in detail about this. And, you know, we reached out to Chris Pinnell and others that had worked with the mini med school. And we asked for some information basically on, you know, give us some of your slides that they had just produced on, on cancer. And so, you know, we really try to incorporate some of the latest, you know, groundbreaking work and try to just make sure that it's digestible for them and it's engaging, um, particularly because we're doing all, all this work on Zoom so they can really understand what's happening and what's out there. So the curriculum development process has been really um, interesting. You know, it's really a, a cycle that we go through. And so we, you know, we had this original data, we really updated it and did a lot of work on cultural adaptations. Um, once we presented it to them, you know, we asked for feedback and they really tried to tell us, you know, what was missing, what they needed, things like that. And so really that feedback process has really, I think, helped us understand that. And for our, our entire group, we really have to do a, a lot of work of making sure that we, we listen to the champions because they're experts in what isn't going to work for their community. So we try to listen to them very carefully to make sure that we are taking in the information that they want for us to do and then presenting it back in the way that they want. 
So we're right now working uh, on a manuscript to kind of outline this engagement activities for communities. Um, how do you make sure that you're going to produce information and materials that are relevant? And so we kind of have these four areas that we've really kind of focused on doing this. Um, and one in particular, I think that should not be neglected is the positive framing. You know, we're going to uh, a, a kind of an impoverished sort of community that's often told that, you know, this is another thing that you're not doing so well at. So how do you try to take a disparity and put it in a positive light is really challenging. And so what we're really been trying to do is try to figure out how to do that. And, and it's a really interesting project that we've been working on. We've been engaging with a, a lot of different um, researchers um, and our champions, when they're out there in the community, we, we pay them about, we pay them a stipend to go and we'll do about 10 hours of education in, in the community a month. And we really have empowered them to go out there and to talk to organizations that they're aware of. Um, because there's a lot of different community organizations that are working in the Minneapolis area trying to improve their community's health that just don't have access to all of these tools and all this knowledge that we do. And so we're really acting as a hub. And so we've really started to develop a, a team to really support that. Um, as the champions are telling us about different organizations that are interested in knowing more about this, you know, and they're saying, oh yes, we, I talked to this organization. They wanna do something. Um, we're really trying to act as a hub to try to kind of collate a lot of this information and link groups together. And these are some of our champions um, that are out there in the community doing work. Um, and since we've had to, for COVID reasons, kind of switch to uh, a really just a virtual presence, we really tried to change a few things for our, our approach. And so I'm just gonna give you a, a couple of tidbits of what we've been doing here. So one of the nice things that we do um, with this is we provide some training. So two to three hours of training, talking about uh, the materials that we've developed and some of the slides that I've shown you, giving them a lot of education. Um, the champions check in monthly as a group with us to talk about the work that they've been doing. And then we do a lot of work behind the scenes to provide them with a lot of materials, uh, particularly a lot of different flyers around this to help encourage them and give them information that they can pass out. Um, and so really what we're focusing on, uh, our champions focus on are a lot of the barrier breaking eliminating the myths, things like I'm too busy to get screened, it doesn't happen to me, I'm too young, all of those things. And our champions really do a great job sharing their personal stories um, online or in person um, to engage women and really tell them, look, it, it happened to me and it could happen to you. So this is really one of the things that's important for you. You really need to do this. Um, and they also do a lot of really, really great work. I mean, they will actually help women get to places. If you, if a woman says, I can't get there, they will, I will drive you. I will, I will help you get there. Um, they give out their phone numbers. They give out their cards. Um, they're working with community partners and all of this kind of creates a really warm, comforting environment for this community. And so, you know, they're not saying, you know, call so-and-so they're saying, call Benita at Sage. She will help you. You know, she's going to do this. And they give Benita's number and they know Benita. And so this is really helpful for uh, communicating this further. Um, we also work and we give out a lot of flyers. So we're always looking for more flyers about breast cancer. Um, and we've been working with some of the people that have given us flyers to make sure that they're culturally appropriate. Um, we work with East and West African, East and West African. So there's a lot of different languages. And so we've been really trying to think about some ways that we can tr easily translate some of those materials over into their language so that they're a little bit easier to pass out and for people to understand. And then we're always working with cultural concepts. Another thing that's a part of this toolkit is, is a flipbook that really focuses on allowing women the opportunity to, be, uh, to, to kind of do this and actually talk about a lot of the very specifics about cancer. Um, this is one of the things we're not able to do right now, but this is one of the things that's in their toolkit. And we've also been doing a lot of work on social media. Um, and so we have a, a great student who works with us and does our social media campaign. Um, we're on all three platforms there, as you can see, and she has a real agenda. So we make about three posts a week targeting these specific areas. Um, and our champions are really engaged in getting their stories out there into the community. 
So here is Sister Benita uh, at the at a church giving out some materials. And here are a couple of our social media posts. And so we really started to do a good job. We our social media campaign started in uh, October. So we've really done a great job starting to get out there and reaching a lot of different audiences. And we're hoping to continue this and, and improve our social media impact. Um, within the last six months for we've had this grant, we've been able to get about um, 300, we've reached about 398 women um, at, at various locations. Women go to their grocery stores, they go to nail salons. Um, we've done a lot of work trying to get out there in the community and um, really trying to engage as much as we can. So what are some future steps of this? So one thing, this project is still ongoing. So if you are familiar with someone who belongs to one of these two communities that would be interested is really uh, already involved in our community and would really like to get some expertise on breast cancer um, research and really would like to go out there, uh, we'd love to um, have them as a part of our team. We're really trying to extend this work and continue it going. So you could reach us at either of these emails or the email that I'll show you later. Um, to go ahead and have someone uh, reach out and become part of this program. We're still recruiting more champions. We've also started working with um, a number of community organizations that work in cancer. As I said, we really started to try to act as a hub, working between organizations, trying to see how can we combine our efforts to really make impactful uh, action on breast cancer screening disparities. Um, in particular, COVID's really dropped cancer screening disparities around the nation. And so how do we work together to really get people to understand it's safe and you still need to go out there, particularly for um, communities that often screen late. So if we're, they're delaying themselves by another year, this is just something that can be really impactful in their lives. And, and lastly, we're really thinking about taking this a bit further. Um, we want to increase our champions. And one of the things that we know is that our training, even though it's on Zoom, it's still difficult for women. A lot of these women have families, they have other jobs, and they're doing this on their own time. So how do we really increase the ability for them to get trained and get out there in their communities and have the knowledge that they want without having to kind of wait for one of our events or things like that? And so we're really looking to moving this content and everything more into an online platform. Um, and um, this is also kind of something that we're looking um, for as well is that our community members want more information. Many of them have heard of these terms about triple negative um, BRCA genes, HAR2, and they want to know more about this. And so they really want to know things about how does that affect screening? How does that affect me? Um, things like breast density. And so if, if there are researchers here that are experts on this area and would like to be and talk about those sorts of things, that would be great. Um, so go ahead and contact me and we're looking to extend this beyond uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul into other communities. If we can become more virtual as we're all working in this kind of virtual space, um, how can we really extend this work into other communities that have um, a, some, some black populations as well? All right, and I think that's it for my talk. And so thank you very much. Um, for listening to me, and then I will go ahead and try to answer questions now. Great, thanks. Uh, that was a really great talk. If we have any questions, you can either uh, send them to uh, Dr. Haynes via the Q&A module. Otherwise, you can raise your hand, and we have an attendee that has raised their hand, so I will uh, call on Dr. Yi here. Uh, Dr. Yee, can you hear? Thank, thanks. Uh, they, that was really great, and it was an incredible amount of information. So one thing, I'll volunteer anybody on the breast cancer team to work with you. Just feel free to contact me directly, and I'll try to connect you with uh, what community needs are with the right experts. But the question is, if I'm interpreting things correctly, uh, the fact that uh, uh, American Indian women screen at a reasonably high rate um, but also at the same time have per capita worse breast cancer mortality uh, than the other populations in our state. Um, this argues that it's the increased cancer mortality in American 
Indian women is not about lack of screening, but about something else. Is that the correct interpretation of your data? Um, so what we don't have in this yet is the stage that when you're screened. So I think in the data and what we've seen preliminary is that the, the African-American women are screening late. More of them are being diagnosed with stage two and stage three than stage one. And so if they're being diagnosed at those stages, then there's the, you know, obviously the mortality rate increases. So we're seeing that they're, they're screening now, but they're screening much later in life and they're more likely because of um, genetics and other things to have a more aggressive cancer. Okay, thanks. You know, one of the challenges always is if, if you screen positive, what's your access to healthcare to deal with that in the appropriate way? And I, I'm guessing that's part of the problem that uh, we're identifying here. Right, and so, um, and that's one of the things I think that we're going to be trying to think about in the future will be, how do you provide more access? Now, SAGE does the screening, they don't do the treatment, mm -hmm. but they also do provide and help connect with community partners that do provide treatments. And that's, um, in particular, one of the things that we're trying to work with the other cancer organizations that provide funding for cancer treatment, just to try to figure out that um, maybe like you call it a continuum of care, right? Where it's not just getting the screening, but it's like, if you get screened and you have this, now you're set up to essentially get all your treatments paid out because that's really, those are those gaps, right? And every time someone falls through one of those, that's just going to reduce the quality of life. Yeah, great, thanks. So there's one question in the chat about partnerships with screening for colon, colon cancer. Um, I have not necessarily really thought about partnerships, but I do think that a lot of these approaches could be moved over um, to different cancers. Uh, right now, one of the limitations with the particular the SAGE program is that they don't have a big footprint of data for colon cancer. Um, but there are other groups that do have a lot of the data to understand the screening rate. So I think it would be great to move this into other cancers, um, not just for the data approach, but for um, lots of different aspects of the program. Okay, um, I'll give the attendees another minute or two, but I think that's um, pretty much all the questions we have for today's seminar. So um, I just wanted to thank you, uh, Dr. Haynes, for giving this talk. It was great. Um, and uh, I think we'll wrap that up. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, have a great Tuesday. Stay warm. <laughs>